So what about cortisol? Cortisol, I've got a lot of videos on it. I've even got a short form video that's super interactive. Definitely go check that out. But if you're not familiar, cortisol is your primary stress hormone. And in burst, it is essential. But when it's chronically elevated, it does start wrecking your system, including your hair. Now, cortisol actually reduces the production of two proteins that kind of act like scaffolding and signaling molecules in the follicle. It also suppresses GAS6, which is a molecule that helps activate dormant hair follicles in their stem cells. It also pushes follicles into an extended rest, so into that telogen phase, preventing growth initiation. So as you can see, the answer isn't just to throw a bunch of products at your hair. I mean, in actuality, even adding something like HRT might not be the best solution. And Realistically, I would try to walk it back and figure out what is the actual culprit? What is the cause behind the chronic, uh, chronically elevated cortisol? And what can we do to modify that so that your body is not stuck in this limbo? What about metabolic function? So yeah, thyroid hormone. And this is one that I do have a full comprehensive video on the effects of T4 and T3 and how this can make fat loss a lot easier or inadvertently a lot harder. Now, what you might not know is that your hair follicles are highly metabolic. Now, they are deeply affected by shifts in T4 and T3. So when your thyroid hormones are in balance, they actually promote keratinocyte proliferation. So these kind of, or this kind of acts like building blocks for the hair shaft. They also extend the growth phase. They suppress premature follicle death, which, I mean, sounds great. And a lot of people fall into this trap where, you know, maybe they go through phases where their results, their lab work shows they're hypothyroid. So they think, okay, let's just start exogenous thyroid support. So T4 and T3 or uh, exclusively T4 or T3. Now, this is where people really go wrong. Too much thyroid medication, especially T3, can actually speed up the entire hair cycle this can cause strands to cycle out too fast and shed prematurely. Bottom line, more isn't always better. And I don't find many people, healthy individuals who are using thyroid support in some form or fashion, typically needing to go over 25 micrograms of T3. And even within that scope, I mean, I'll say like going up to 25 micrograms of T3 for some people is very much in that territory of being too strong. So keep an eye on it. If you're on thyroid support and you're like, well, I just want to be able to maintain a leaner physique or realistically, I, I like um, that I have a little bit more energy. We can't overlook the fact that there are markers that we can very easily track and make sense of that would indicate whether you're now pulling from hypo to normal to now hyperthyroid. So we want to look at that TSH and Personally, for me, I tend to see most people feel best right at that 1.0 or slightly under that, but it's usually that 0.5, um, and that's not a hard line in the sand. Some people experience these symptoms at 0.7 or 0.8 or even 1.0, but realistically, when I start to see numbers under 0.5 for TSH, if I don't feel great about that, and I'm always following up the questions like, okay, like, do you feel like this is impeding any kind of recovery? Do you feel like this is hindering your sleep? Um, are you noticing any kind of acceleration in hair shedding, um, even like nail breakage? Just little things here and there that, you know, can go missed oftentimes. But we want to keep an eye out on this, especially those who are supplementing, because oftentimes the thought is more is better. But with this, there very much is a ceiling, and that ceiling is dictated by your individual homeostatic clock. So we also got to pay attention to IGF-1 and insulin. Now, these don't get talked about enough in regards to hair loss, but they are crucial. IGF-1 is going to be crucial in supporting cell survival. And specifically, when we're looking at the signals in the follicle, it's also going to suppress catagen entry, and it's also going to increase local growth factor activity specifically around the follicle. So in layman's speak, if your metabolism is underfueled, if you're finding that you're in that perma diet cycle where you don't really know why you're staying this lane or why you're restricting food, but it feels like the thing you should do, yet you are experiencing some kind of degree of hair loss or hair thinning, this might actually be where the answer lies. And 
And we're talking about like overtraining, low carb diets, um, even insulin resistance. You're in a way kind of cutting off the supply line to your hair. Now, what about estrogen? This one is huge as it enhances follicular lifespan. Now, this is why during pregnancy, when estrogen levels are sky high, women often notice thicker, denser hair. Estrogen actually extends that antigen phase. It increases hair shaft diameter and it does reduce overall shedding. But especially in the postpartum phase, once estrogen drops after or in the case of, let's say, someone who's stopping birth control or someone who's taking something to modulate estrogen, even something over the counter like DIM or calcium glucurate. Um, and of course, obviously, during menopause, those benefits, those pro-estrogen benefits, they kind of disappear. And it's also about ratios. So low estradiol relative to free test increases that risk of androgenic miniaturization. So when we look at someone who's in an extended fat loss phase or someone who is getting super lean, it's very undernourished. Maybe they're getting on stage. Maybe they're using things that intentionally bring estrogen down. In the presence of very high androgens, this isn't doing your hair any favors. And even if like technically your free test is within range or your total test is within range, but estradiol is lower, things can technically come back normal. And depending on where you are in your cycle length, that might be given the green light by your provider or your coach. But we really have to look at the ratios here, especially if you're someone who is symptomatic and currently seeing signs of hair loss or hair thinning. Now, another big player that oftentimes gets overlooked is prolactin. And although this one is mostly known for its role in lactation, it also interacts with the hair follicles. And we really have to look at it in the case that it's elevated because elevated prolactin can delay antigen entry, it can trigger premature catagen, and it can blunt that follicular signaling in a way similar to cortisol. Now, this can be a hidden player in chronic hair loss caused by medications, pituitary dysfunction, or chronic stress exposure. So when we're looking at things zoomed out, overall, these are levels that in the case that you're experiencing symptoms of hair thinning, hair shedding, hair loss, or overall you're just noticing the integrity and the porosity of your hair is declining or just different than what you were once used to. It's absolutely worth getting these hormones checked and not just giving, you know, the green light if your provider is like, yeah, you're healthy, you're in shape, you're in range, like what's the problem? But really taking these under a microscope and comparing them to other relevant values. The reality is when your hormones are in check, when your metabolism is fed and the follicular environment stable, growth isn't random. It's inevitable. And that's when we need to consider, okay, how do we get you from where you are to a point where you can begin to see those changes on a regular basis? 